Ms. Newberg, let me ask you a question. If you're sailing across the ocean and you're picking up trash along the way, and for every one piece of trash that you pick up, there's a boat right next to you dumping out five pieces, how would that make you feel? If you use that logic, then I am also dumping a lot of trash in the ocean. And uh, then I would, I would stop dumping my trash in the ocean and tell the other boat to stop dumping their trash in the ocean as well. And, 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 and that's, that's the important point here. I, I think that what we need to be doing is we need to be focusing on the countries that are dumping trash in the ocean. Of course, that's a metaphor. Uh, the fact that China is uh, – here we are talking about reducing emissions, yet China, under the Paris Accords, are going to be increasing their emissions by nearly 50 percent, five gigatons annually. So, so while in the United States we need to continue investing in innovative solutions and exporting clean energy technologies, it makes no sense for us to be doing it if we're simply watching for increases in, in China. I have a question. When your children ask you, did you do absolutely everything in your power to stop the climate crisis when the storms are getting worse and we're seeing all the effects of the climate crisis, when they ask you, did you do everything? Can you really look them in the eye and say, no, sorry, I couldn't do anything because that country over there didn't do anything, so if they're not going to do it, then I'm not. That is shameful, and that is cowardly. And so I just don't understand, as a parent, how can you look your kid in the eye and say, there is this impending crisis, um, everything is at stake. But I stood back and I didn't really do anything, I didn't take action, I didn't act like it was an emergency because our neighbors over there weren't doing it, so I'm just not going to. H how can you tell your children that? Um, I just... Uh, I think I don't need to add anything, but just... Another perspective, I am from Sweden, it's a small country, and there it is the same argument. Why should we do anything, just look at the U.S., they say. So, uh, just so you know, that's, that is being used against you as well. <laughs> Mr. Summers, did you realize back uh, several months ago at an oversight hearing, I asked Ms. Greta Thurn. Thurnberg, who is a spokesman, um, you know, for the for the Green New Deal and and, and other issues the Democrats have, she has seventeen point nine million followers. I ask her um, with China and India, how are we going to get them to cut their emissions when that when 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 they're the leaders in the world and America has come down on on emissions? What do uh, you realize? She said they were going to ask them to. Is this a proper response? In your opinion. Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Um, as you know, the United States accounts for about 12.6 percent of world emissions, and our emissions continue to go down year on year. China's emissions account for about 32 percent, point six, 32.6 percent of world emissions, and their emissions continue to go up. The key point is that, yes, climate change is real and that we need to step up to the plate and do what we can to address the climate challenge. But at the same time, this is a global challenge. This isn't a challenge that can be taken on just by one company by, or by one country. We need a global solution to the climate challenge. But this industry has not waited for uh, others to step up to the plate to deal with that challenge. In fact, Earlier this year, the American Petroleum Institute put forward a very forward-looking position on climate change and API's climate action framework. And the interesting thing about that framework, Congressman, is that it's not just about what we're asking the government to do, but what the industry is committing to do to reduce climate change over time. And we're proud of that forward-looking agenda. But as you point out, this is a global challenge. And the world's going to continue to demand oil and gas for the future. The question I think lawmakers have to answer is whether the world's going to get that oil and gas from the United States, where it is produced cleaner, better, and safer, or whether they're going to get that oil and gas from countries that are hostile to American interests. 
I think the answer is clear from our perspective. And this administration is content to get get our, our, our natural gas and oil, as Mr. Jordan said, and, and paying ungodly amounts in the future if we can get gas from countries that don't like us. Does that make sense to you? Congressman, thank you again for your question. Just, just I mean, does that make sense? No, sir. No, and nor does Greta Thun Thunberg's answer, which is, was a Pollyannish answer, saying, yes, we will ask them to be nice, uh, it does not make sense. Uh, Mr. Summers, isn't it true that most of the raw materials and manufacturing capacity for renewables necessary to execute uh, Biden's zero emissions goal comes from China? That is the case, Congressman. And does China's ability to manufacture renewables ch cheaply have anything to do with the fact that their factories are powered by oil and gas or that their economy runs on 84 percent fossil fuels? Congressman, uh, the Chinese economy continues to expand not just uh, uh, oil and gas infrastructure, but in fact, based on the data that we've seen, China is adding a coal plant a week. Uh, their emissions continue to go up while American emissions continue to go down, mainly because the United States has made a fuel switch from coal as the primary source of power to natural gas. And that is because natural gas prices have gone, gotten lower as a consequence of the technological and innovative revolution that occurred in this country over the course of the last decade. We're able to find more of this energy here at home. And as a consequence of that, we've been actually able to reduce emissions while even while our production is going up. In fact, no country, no country uh, in the world has reduced emissions more than the United States. And it's because of the American oil and gas industry. And China is not being held to the same uh, emission standards that we are. Yet the Biden administration and the questions you've had don't even address this. They are content to buy from countries that don't like us and let Americans suffer as they pay for not just gas, but every other uh, commodity that they're trying to buy now. Um, I now yield to uh, Congressman Fock. I, uh, my time has elapsed, so I recognize you for your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Thun Thunberg, thank you for your involvement here today. I commend you for your willingness to uh, to testify and get involved with public policy. Um, in the past, when you're talking about climate change, you have said, quote, I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. Uh, is there, what, what particular study or re scientific report did you read that, make, that made you come to this conclusion? Uh, thank you for your question. First of all, let me just clear that those are metaphors. Um, in speeches, you often use metaphors. Of course, I don't mean literally that I want people to panic. Uh, so, so there was no scientific study that, that made me come to that conclusion. Oh, okay, so you didn't say that. I did, but it's a metaphor that you often use in speeches. Metaphor for what? I mean, how, but, how do you, what I'm asking on panic I want you to panic. What does that tell me what you meant by that? By that, I mean that I want people to step out of their comfort zones. Um, yeah. And to not just see the climate crisis as a far distant threat, but rather as something that is impacting people already today. And uh, people to step out of their comfort zones to start taking real action. Okay. What, what in your opinion, is... Uh, on the PPM parts per million, what is acceptable, uh, permissible uh, on, on CO2 emissions, in your opinion? What, what, what actual amount do you think is permissible? Well, I mean, of course, there is no uh, magic amount that uh, says that this is an okay amount. Uh, science doesn't really work that way. But, um, but of course, we can say that it is the more... Uh, the higher the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is, the, the bigger the risks are going to be. So, um, I mean, you can't say that there's one amount that is acceptable and, and not. Of course, uh, there's not one magic tipping point where everything is beyond saving and so on. But uh, rather, we should try to keep it as low as possible. Okay, so you wouldn't, wouldn't name a particular number. What about China, India, the other countries where there's in this 
if this bill passes, there's no retribution against these com these uh, countries uh, that's going to offset anything we do here in America. What is your take on that? Uh, well, if we just thought like that, it would be very convenient, wouldn't it? Uh, but rather, we need to see the, the holistic perspective. How can we, if we take, for example, India as an, as an example, how can we expect India to take action when, when, the, when the developed countries who have actually promised to lead the way won't do that? Uh, when, when, if we take into account the global aspect of equity, I mean, there are many, many people around the world who need to be able to raise their standard of living. And if we who live in high income countries aren't able to take a few steps back in order to let other people uh, raise their living standard, then. I mean, that doesn't that just doesn't make any sense. And of course, those countries definitely need to take their responsibility as well. Uh, and that's why we need global cooperation. And if countries won't take action, then. There is no global cooperation. If the US, for example, which is the biggest emitter in history, won't take action, then how can we expect other countries to do that? So taking action ourselves is also a guarantee that, that other countries, I mean, it will it will be a snowball effect, most likely. If one country does something, then other countries will follow. If no country does something, then no one will follow. Okay, so China is an example, which is a communist uh, they practice genocide on their people. They will watch America and then will just voluntarily reduce their emissions. Is that your thoughts? No, I mean, if I mean, we should do, of course, everything we can to make sure that China takes their responsibility. Um, but I mean, there is not really much. I mean, all I can do is to try to advocate for, for global change. All you can do is to, to take action and try to create a global pressure on China so that they will have to take action. As you say, we can't just go there and ask ask them to do it. Uh, that would be very nice, but yeah, we need to think realistically as well. Yeah, there's, there's nothing in the in the bill that puts any type of pressure other than, I guess, showing the example. Ms., uh, thank you for your testimony. Ms. Macarola, um, can, you, can you address the, uh, the direct employment in the United States um, that the Green New Deal would affect. We're all seeing the gas prices jump 70, you know, 70 cents or more. We're now dependent on foreign countries uh, that particularly don't have our best interests. Can you, can you discuss how this Green New Deal would affect energy costs, gas costs, and the many other minerals that uh, they are prohibiting to be mined in other states? Sure. Thank, thank you for your question, uh, Congressman Norman. I, th I think it's first important to look at the job creation within the oil and gas industry. We support uh, 10 million jobs in the U.S. economy, nearly 7 percent of uh, the U.S. economy. On this committee alone, uh, 325,000 jobs uh, supported by the industry, 75,000 directly. Um, and let's talk about what the tax increases that are being proposed would do. In 2017, as a result of uh, reducing the corporate tax rate, uh, we created over a period of uh, 19 straight reports, the lowest poverty rate in 60 years since the government kept that statistic. We created jobs for 19 straight months with wage growth over that period of time prior to the pandemic. The reason we did that was 70% of the savings from the tax cuts went directly to wages. That's right into the American people's pockets. On energy, what has what, what the result been on energy of the American energy revolution? Over the past decade, as increases in costs have gone up by double digits in healthcare, education, and food costs. Energy costs have gone down by 15%. The tax proposals considered here would drive those costs up. That would mean real costs for consumers. That would mean jobs. Uh, it's essential that we not go in that direction. Thank you for your question, Congressman. Okay. 
you would agree corporations don't pay taxes. People pay taxes, don't they? People do pay taxes. And the fact that the depreciation schedules differ from industry to industry, the oil and gas industry uh, is not like my industry, the real estate business. It's a different type of business. One, one size doesn't fit all. Would you agree? One size does not fit all for all industries. That's right, Congressman. Right, I, I, I want to give you some more time. Your time is going to expire, but I want to be polite. So uh, maybe just a, one or two more. Well, that's fine, Chairman. I, I didn't. Re- thank, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, you, can answer, you can answer the question, the witness. Sure. That, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the question, Ranking Member. I think what, what we're, you know, what, what you try to do in a tax code is to provide revenues to meet government services, but you need to ensure a fair return for the taxpayer, but also U.S. competitiveness. We are in an increasingly globally interconnected world where competitiveness is essential. Some of the provisions that are discussed, that the chairman discussed would uh, directly impact that competitiveness, particularly the double taxation uh, on uh, income earned or on taxes paid overseas. Um, So it's absolutely essential that you look through the lens of U.S. competitiveness as you you establish uh, provisions within the tax code. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Ranking Member. I now uh, want to recognize